Hello, I'm Tio, your quantum group professor. So uh, this is the sixth series, uh, the sixth uh, lecture and final of the series. It's going to be about uh, many, many things on how introduction to, to research, or at least to a small part of, uh, of research. Uh, so let's find first this, um, this presentation. Here we go. Uh, orientability to our also groups and matrix models so there will be many many things in continuation to what we uh, we learned so we'll do six things actually uh, so first easiness will review a bit what we know and uh, more things about it then orientability uh, I'll tell you what that means which is related somehow to easiness then other questions which are also related so you see there are three groups of two about uh tori that's something that we haven't talked about well this maximal tori you know they play a very important role in uh the group theory so we'll try to do this kind of things here then we'll talk a bit about non-commutative geometry i mean we have these quantum groups right and uh, remember we have the spheres two and the tori so can we construct some non-commutative geometry out of this Algebraic a priori, but why not a bit Riemannian to by integrating? Uh, we'll see. Then uh, we'll talk about matrix models. That's once again something that we haven't talked yet. So uh, remember, sister algebras, uh, there were three theorems Gelfand, GNS, and finite dimensional. The main one has been Gelfand and GNS, and uh, everything that we did was based on Gelfand, GNS. We haven't really uh, used that. So we have to remember now these algebras that we're using, actually they're operator algebras, so uh, they're formed by, by infinite matrices somehow. So can we uh, model these functions on our quantum groups by, uh, by matrices, let's say by random matrices? That's a very interesting question. So this and the Tori actually, these are things really that we missed. So uh, definitely we have to discuss them now in the, in the final lecture. And finally, models, well, there are many types of uh, interesting models. It goes to many things like uh, subfactor theory, other things, physics. So we'll, uh, we'll talk about uh, some of them at the end, just a little bit. Okay, so uh, in order to start easiness, uh, well, this was our definition. So one group will cause easy. If the category uh, Tanakian comes from partition, that was the formula for the implementation. Iranian basis of CN, delta pi, chronic error symbols. So that's a definition, but it has many things behind it. So uh, first of all, once you have this, uh, well, you can only enlarge the set somehow, take saturates these these right? As for the um, quality still remain to be true. And the saturated thing will be a category of partitions in the sense that we, uh, we talked about last time. Also, any category of partition produces a, a, an easy quantum group just by this formula and Tanakian duality. So that's another thing to be known. Also, remark the categories of partitions are there's no end there. Okay, there's something delinearized and without end. These quantum groups, the easy ones, come in series. I mean, there's one for any n. So yeah, there are many things here. There's just a reminder what's what's easiness, but uh, there are, yeah, basically it's a, it's something built on uh, on Tanaka. It's the simplest class of easy quantum groups that are um, of quantum groups from the point of view of Tanakian duality. Now, we've seen many examples, but now somehow for keeping things simple, let's just focus on eight of them, namely these ones. Orthogonal unitary, of course, here on the right face. And on the left face, we have all this, uh, remember from last time, <coughs> you have all this permutation and complex reflection groups, which form a series of uh, parameter S. So I'll just keep here S is two, S is infinity. So S is 2 is the hyperoctahedral group. S is infinity is the big complex reflection group. So all these things are important. And uh, with respect to uh, what we know, well, S and SM plus are not inside, OK? So see later, there are very good reasons for not putting S and SN inside, because uh, 
this cube has a lot of geometric structure, you can do a lot of things, and uh, if you try putting SN here instead of HN, uh, many of these things will collapse. So it's, uh, we're getting here at the very technical level, so uh, I told you that easiness and quantum permutations are very related, but now we're getting advanced and uh, the theory separates somehow, it's, it's not exactly the same thing, so quantum permutations go on their own, uh, they will be back later in, uh, in this talk. No worry for them, and easiness goes somehow in the other sense. It's better to avoid the sin and uh, in general things with, with single tones in the category. Also the bistochastic group, we haven't talked about them. So there's a whole, we're, we're not trying to separate uh, things somehow, do easiness separately from, uh, from uh, quantum permutations. So that's why the quantum reflections are actually important in this easiness business, not exactly the quantum permutations. More on this later, you'll see. This cube is really amazing and uh, you cannot change it, that's it. Now, uh, so these are easy, right? That's something that we know to be more precise here are the categories of partitions. So we have, uh, what's the pattern here? P means, uh, par P means partitions. And uh, the subscripts are the number of uh, the sizes of blocks. So two means pairings, even means with even blocks. Then NC means non crossing. And all this calligraphic thing um, are uh, stand for matching pairs, so that's the unitary case, okay? So we have here a real face, and uh, below it's the, uh, the unitary face, so there you have colors, so pairings must, must match the colors. Now we've also seen, also computed the asymptotic laws of the characters, so very important. Uh, so, what do we have here? In the classical case, uh, O-N Gaussian law, of course, U-N complex Gaussian. Then here we had H-N and K, and these are the so-called Bessel laws, uh, the ones we talked about last time. And, uh, well, this is the real Bessel law, and this is the pure complex Bessel law somehow. Now on top here, when you liberate, uh, so first of all, the liberation is exactly this Berkovich but by ejection in peak probability. You see, that's why I put uh, arrows here on the vertical. And, uh, so the Gaussian law goes to Wigner semicircle. That's what we got for n plus. Complex Gaussian goes to the Wojtulescu circular law. That's uh, something we, we talked about it too. And then these Bessel things go into free Bessel things. So very good, all this is compatible with free probability. In a certain sense, it's a bit better because you see, we have all these bijections here, very nice, but in our setting, we have arrows in all senses also. So uh, you see, the cube has arrows in all senses. It's, it's more better. Well, I mean, this is algebra, right? So we're of course, good at algebra here. <laughs> so as long as it's algebra, we can be better. But uh, free probability, of course, is not analysis. So. At least here, we won't really get into that, uh, that business. Now, uh, what are the questions? Now, there are just so many. So here I selected some of them of uh, relation with easiness that uh, look uh, one personal preference, let's say. So first of all, of course, classify. <laughs> no question about it. Classify these quantum groups. And here, uh, well, here, so Maurice Weber and his team, they, they are, working a lot on this and it's uh well it's quite hard it's not for tomorrow the classification and the thing is that i think this cube is really interesting so yeah just stay about uh, above hn you see i mean if you put the sn somehow here try to put the sn in the picture you get all these these weird things with single tones and this stochastic so that's uh i think that's a reasonable assumption to classify things between HN and UN plus, it's, it's very important, this HL. Okay, so that's a question. Then also compute the loss of characters. So what we did here is uh, is interesting. And uh, when you do this, you get many uh, many ideas for free probability. Once you get to a measure, these guys know, and uh, or classical probability. So it's extremely uh, fruitful to have the loss of characters. And the program here is, uh, is a bit not very advanced. I mean, uh, well, in good old times, when I was working on that, Bichon Collins, Crunch Piker, every time we introduce a quantum group, we computed also the, 
the law. Now uh, these younger guys, uh, well, they kind of keep computing laws. I don't know, well, times are changing. <laughs> I think it's a very good question. And finally, a question which is interesting and very hot is that, uh, so there are some classifications for the uh, real easy quantum groups, in particular those which are hyperoctahedral by Ron Weber, they found the uh, family and the series. And uh, also very, very recently, Mung and Weber classified the unitary ones when they found the series and the family. And the series depend on a parameter and the families here, uh, gamma is a group and C is the, is a complement of a semi-group inside them. But uh, I think all this since we have series followed by family and uh, family followed by series, there should be some kind of contravariant duality between these beasts. So uh, that's a very good question, I think. Okay, now let's uh, maybe go to, to another topic, orientability. So once again, this cube, this cube will appear many times. <laughs> I really, uh, really love this cube. So the claim is that this is an intersection and in generation diagram in the sense that for any face, which is just a square, the small object appears, so you have your face, and uh, so that's the small, that's the big. So the small one appears by intersecting these guys, and the big one appears by, it's the smallest one group containing these guys, the generation operation. And uh, well, that's a bit between, you know, um, between a claim and CRM, uh, where, uh, well, this talk is at a very advanced level, okay, so in introduction to research, I'll tell you what happens. Uh, you see, we don't have any more uh, theorem proof. Um, it's, a, it's a more of a research presentation. So what happens is the following, in what concerns intersection, everything is fine. So you have this operation for quantum groups, you divide by an ideal, okay. At the Zanakian level, this corresponds to the category generated, uh, that's understood. In the easy case, this means that, uh, it's exactly the same thing at Tanaka, but delinearized. So uh, if, you're on the, if GH are easy, then so is the intersection, and that's your category of partitions. So this is very good because for the cube, let's try to prove that it's an intersection, we must prove that this diagram over here is a generation diagram. So I don't know, for instance, here, no crossing pairings and, uh, and what? Uh, no crossing pairings. Uh, are the intersection of all pairings with no crossing with even blocks, clear. I know we want to prove it's a generation story. Sorry, so let's, uh, yeah, pairings and no crossing even generate P even, sure. So everything is clear. Okay, so for Cuba, uh, it works, the intersection now. For the generation property, by Tanaka, it transforms to intersection. You see these operations are some hard work, which are the intersection generation. But in the easy case, you don't really get uh, what you want. So uh, you have to proceed in this way. There is a difficulty there. You have to define, uh, even to easy quantum groups, you define the easy generated thing like this. And it's bigger than the usual one. Conjecturally, it's an isomorphism, but no one knows how to prove this. So you can't really get it by easiness. I mean, this this claim here that the cube is a generation diagram. Uh, you have to use some ad hoc techniques, and there are just so many. I mean, the there is quite developed on this intersection generation business, especially by by Alex Kiru, by C2. and uh, you get it for five faces, and uh, the missing one is here, not on the left. K n plus generated by K n and H n plus. This is not known yet. So, uh, yeah, well, there's one, this 99% true, of course. You need to find the proof, but especially the conjecture. I mean, that's, that's a very good question, which is to be added to this easiness question I was talking about. That's, uh, that's a big problem about easiness. But I didn't add it because if you want to find this contravariant duality, certainly you'll have to use that. That's my, my guess. So I'll get into the conjecture here. So it's here already in a disguised form. Okay, now, uh, well, that's a problem with the cubes, so, but basically it is, yeah, yeah, almost sure, 99%. Now I have this uh, this theorem, which is very funny. So ground zero theorem. So the twist double is uniform oriented compact quantum groups. 
are exactly the eight ones, where easy means easy, we know. Uniform means that uh, it's somehow uniform. I mean, it's in a kind of projective living situation. Twistable means that they contain HM. That's uh, the, the assumption that we love here. We don't want permutations and singletons. And oriented, this is a tricky thing. So if you take something inside, okay, so between HN and UN plus, it will sit inside the cube and then you can project right on edges and uh, faces. And the problem is that when you project, for instance, like this, like this, it should be the same as like this, like this. So the projections must be coherent. And that's by definition orientability. Orientability means that uh, your quantum group, the projections are coherent. You're, you're really in three dimensions there. So that's a theorem and uh, it's really cool. So it's something I have on, was it last year or two years ago? And uh, well, it all follows from this. Uh, you basically take the class easy classification results of, uh, of Moritz and the others. And uh, well, you just add all the axioms and you get an enormous cleanup, and, uh, you'll get it. And uh, orientability is very important because this, this results of Weber and the others especially uh, concern the edges in general. But if it's orientable, it can be reconstructed from the projections on the edges. So finally, it must be one of the, the eight vertices. Now, uh, why ground zero? Well, what we're doing here is really uh, like throwing bombs, right? I mean, we have all these quantum groups, okay? All of them that every mankind has ever imagined. So what are the axioms? Voronovich, of course. S squared is the identity, twistability, easiness, uniformity, orientability. With the six axioms, we will kill everything. There's nothing left. Just this uh, kind of skeleton and you can build afterwards what you want. So what do we want? Of course, you mainly want easiness. So uh, you want to forget about all these things. <laughs> Go back to the easy case. That's an important problem. but. You can also forget about easiness and get into uniformity, for instance. I think that's a very good question. Just trying to classify the uniform quantum groups. So again, it's between H and UN plus such that it lives in 3D and uh, the projections are coherent somehow. And here, here are a few conjectures that I have. So in the classical case, it's definitely doable. And you get things like SON. Uh, this is not easy, okay, because of the determinant. And also very importantly, the full series of reflection groups. So these reflection groups complex, they are this series, HNSD, it's the whole series that we knew HNS, but with this parameter, uh, which corresponds to the determinant added, plus some exceptional examples. So these, these guys are oriented. And well, some bistochastic versions too, that's, that's nice. In the free case now, uh, well, that's uh, that's a good statement. Yeah, there's no. Uh, I think only the easy ones are free means easy. So wait, what what do I mean by free? Living on the upper face here, for instance, containing H and plus. Take any quantum group between H and plus and plus. You might prove that it's uh, it's easy. And in general, this is terrible and known to everyone. But I think the orientable case of how use this projection there might be a way of. Uh, of doing it, but it is terribly difficult. So many conjectures, just check the preference, all that. <laughs> it's very hot. And finally, for group duals, uh, that's the simplest question. So first, uh, question one should work. I mean, it's groups, no longer easy, but you can do it probably with the algebras and uh, finite group knowledge. Problem two looks hard. I mean, that's <laughs> everyone knows about it. Problem three, however, that uh, looks perfectly do uh, doable. So Let's understand group duals. So this lives on this space here. There are discrete some points. Yes, so have the discrete space and continuous space. Group duals are definitely here. So I take a, a group here on the discrete face. So this must be reconstructed from its projections on this edge and this edge. But this edge is exactly that uh, Ron Weber business I was talking about leading finally to that. There is a series by the special a family indexed by a real varieties of real reflection groups. And here on this edge, um, well, it's you probably get basically some, uh, some products of this with some abelian guys. So that's, uh, well, it's not known, I mean, that's, that's fine to 
if you are interested in this, I'll work on this uh, problem number three, I think that would be nice. And then problem number one, number two comes at the end. So personally, just a bit, but I'm now I'm doing books, other things, internet videos, as you can see, blogs. So uh, I don't work on this, okay? So yeah, just uh, uh, very good questions. Oh, we have more questions. Yeah, I think the idea would be to classify now all the, all the quantum groups, somehow the main ones, no one really knows what names means, we can classify all of them, but uh, the idea is that, so all this is in was in three dimensions somehow. Now you have three more dimensions, which are a bit bad, coming from taking the stochastic version, special version, also the diagonal torus. We'll, we'll talk a bit about these things later. Yeah, it's very technical. So, but I think all these six dimensions are uh, are good. For instance, if you take the B stochastic version, I mean, sum is one of the true column of HN, you get a sense of this would include also a set. I said it's back, very good thing. And I think this these six things, somehow you have to imagine there is six dimensions, H1, and I think it's kind of discrete, so you get a six parameter series. But, uh, well, that's a very hard problem. So I think, yeah. But a good definition for main, no one really knows. At least the interesting examples that we have, I think they belong to a three parameter series, each parameter being somehow the corresponding to one of these, uh, these dimensions. Very hard question for the future. Now, let's uh, go to another subject. So enough about easiness. Let's talk about Torah, so that's an interesting thing. So, uh, uh, first, some, this is something that we already met. So the diagonal tori, uh, you just mod out by uh, the relation saying that the, the coordinates must be zero outside the diagonal, and you get the group dual. Why? Because uh, the coordinates in a quotient, the non-zero ones, UII, let's denote in GI, are group-like elements, so they generate a discrete group. Equivalent, you can just intersect if you want to the the biggest single diagonal, which is the dual of the free group. Now, for those quantum groups, yeah, once again, our cube, you get, of course, what do you get? So this was the, you see the face is, is the same in the continuous case and in the discrete case, same uh, tori. So let's just talk about this. So here we're having y and un, you get the usual cube and torus, and here are the free versions. So just put free products here and uh, uh, FM uh, hat here. No, uh, well, uh, all this suggests uh, these notions of soft and hard liberation. So, yeah, very quickly. So, given uh, the problem is how you have a quantum group G and G classical, okay, of the intersect with you, and how these guys appear. And the conjectures are somehow that this appears by enlarging the tori the torus of this. Okay, so let's get into this, or maybe the reflection to start with. So uh, you see given G and UN plus, you can always consider the diagonal torus and also the reflection group. So have torus, the reflection group is bigger, and then G is even bigger. So now you say that G is a soft liberation uh, when uh, it appears by enlarging G class by this K, right? And a hard liberation, which is stronger, if it appears from G class just by, by blowing up the, the, the diagonal torus. Uh, terminology coming on force from Brexit, so this was last year, and I uh, was thinking about these things with soft and hard Brexit, we said, yeah, let's use the same terminology, it's cool. So when does this happen? So for hard liberation, it's, uh, it's hard to establish, actually. It's a result of here, you see too. So it's okay in the continuous case for these guys. And also for these guys, we kind of forgot about them. They were there in the first lectures. It's true also by Bishop de Violet. However, this kind of thing cannot work for SN plus because the tour is there is trivial, okay? You have nothing. So uh, also for the bistochastic ones, you have nothing. And actually, uh, well, this at least they were outside our cube, but these are vertices of favorite cube and it fails to that because of Rome Weber, it's a bit complicated, but uh, that's, uh, yeah, okay, let's not, not get into this. So must, uh, these are good things, definitions, but of course they won't work in general, they fail for all these things, so 
Let's try to improve this. And the idea now is to use, so this was the diagonal torus. Now, the fundamental representation can always be spin by unitary matrix. So if we spin that, the, the torus will get spin too. So in fact, you have a whole family of tori, which are uh, indexed by unitary matrices, okay? So you just spin the fundamental, and then you take the associated diagonal torus. So, there are many conjectures. So first is the generation conjecture. G is generated by its tori. Conjecture is to be true in general. And the best results so far are those of Alex Kirbasi too, but still far away from this. Weak generation. So, well, this is hard. Let's add the G class here, make it simpler. Still conjecture. And this has the advantage of being related to this liberation things, you see. So, our liberation was G class with T1. Uh, we generation is G class with all this tori. And uh, so hard liberation definitely fails for certain quantum groups. This is conjecture to happen all the time, but it's somehow a weak conjecture. I mean, the fact that it's not proved doesn't mean it's, that it's not weak, it's not that useful. So I think that's the good statement. You just take the tori spin by the Fourier matrices. Fourier, I mean, you take. Uh, uh, partition of any two integers, the corresponding product of cyclic groups and the Fourier matrix of that thing. So why Fourier? Because, uh, let's see, uh, well, for SN plus, there is a result of Julian that, uh, that it works, computed all the group dots groups of, of SN plus. Actually, I think we have talked about it last time. So it's exactly the, the Fourier tori which appeared, okay, what we learned last time. This thing is the minimal one computed by, by Julien or uh, Fourier Tori, so that's where the Fourier idea comes from for him. Also, this stochastic works because it's an old observation. Well, now Sven Rome has done some work on that. Is by Fourier, these are isomorphic to the orthogonal unitary groups of dimension less than one. So Fourier is there, there it. And here, uh, yeah, here is not known, but conjecturally true. So the conjecture is that any easy quantum groups appears as a Fourier liberation. This cannot be true in general, so if you just take discrete duals, okay, that's your discrete duals somehow sitting diagonally, and uh, or sitting spin if you take it to the spin representation, and all the other guys are smaller somehow, so you definitely need all these cues for the conjecture to work. So this is really just easy quantum groups, okay, with their standard representation. And I think that would be very interesting because, uh, yeah, okay, good problem for your liberation. Now, some other questions about the torus. This is work I've done before uh, some years ago with this on Patri. So we conjecture somehow that this is the maximal torus, the whole family. So characters can be read there, amenability importantly. So G is coaminable if and only if all the tori are coaminable and also grows. So G has, well, let's put G hat has polynomial growth, if you want, if and only if each TQ hat has polynomial growth. And also there uh, we have this some uh, uh, more detailed conjectures about the growth, like exponents of that. And we check that for group, group duals, and the main is equal groups. In general, we don't know. I think the amenability question is the most important one, proof by guess, and you have to do a lot of Tanaka there, no one knows how to do all that Tanaka, even in the easy case. So I think that's a good question. I mean, ability conjecture in the easy case to learn the partition work. Okay, now, uh, yeah, let's uh, talk about something else, but it's a bit related to the terrain of commutative geometry. So uh, what's an commutative geometry? <laughs> good question. So uh, an idea would be to, uh, well, to take the main objects that we have, so if seen so far, you have uh, spheres, tori, unitary groups, and reflection groups. We're all, all the time playing with these four things. So let's just try to axiomatize somehow the, the quadruplets formed by sphere, torus, unitary group, and complex reflection group. Let's see what we get. And uh, once we we'll get that, we can develop these geometries with more manifolds and integrate Riemannian aspects and go a bit towards what Cohn is doing. This is some kind of a Nash geometry. It's a uh, half coordinates, right? It's Nash. And it's Riemannian too because it can integrate. So it's a kind of Riemannian geometry on Nash. 
the idea is to define it with the coins Humanian geometry, which is more after differential. So that's a uh, yeah, big program. So we'll just talk about step one here. So we have how many 12 correspondences here to be established, and there are two difficulties. One of them, how the torus produces you. And this is this liberation business. So you must appear from ON, the usual ON, and the T <coughs> generated. So <coughs> well, this is true for the main examples. Ferial case be complex case, but it's still worth it on technical recurrence, things like that. So um, yeah, well, it works, okay. <laughs> So it's not that uh, conceptual, but uh, okay, so I solved the difficulty. We know here how T produces U. That's good because somehow T is the smallest, U is the biggest thing here. So yeah, that's good. Another problem is T goes to K. Well, of course, you can cheat. I mean, it goes from T to U, and then U take the reflection group, but let's do it directly. And what happens in the classical case is that K is uh, the reflection group of uh, the, the isometric group of T. And in the free case, it doesn't really work. So, if you take the basic tori, here are the quantum isometric groups, you get these LEM things here, twists of one UN. So, how to fix that? We want to recover the reflection groups. Well, you just intersect with can plus. I mean, if you intersect these guys with can plus, you're exactly H and KN. So the solution to the difficulty is this formula. I mean, you don't take the full isometric group, but just the quantum reflection uh, group of T. So with this, we can axiomatize the NCG. So uh, S T U K should be intermediate between what's smallest, I mean, the real case, classical, and what's biggest, the complex free case. Okay, everything stands there between real classical and complex free. And now I have this uh, correspondences, so these 12 correspondences here they are. So it's basically G plus is quantum isometries. You can see here we have this quantum reflections, generation. SU means uh, yeah, homogeneous space. You just take the first row and that's it. Yeah, so we have all the correspondences, which is pretty nice. So uh, all these things like as basic example, we have real geometry, complex geometry, real free, real complex. And you have also these half liberated things actually. So we're talking a bit about when star and star, also sphere story and all that, the theory works. These are denoted the star here. Also, so these are intermediate between classical and free, the so called basic uh, thing in between. Now, between real and complex, you can always multiply by a t. You get something hybrid there, it's quite natural. So, finally, we have nine main examples of geometries, and uh, well, under some assumptions, meaning easiness and a bit of orientability, you can uh, get it that these are the only ones. You basically get it from uh, Rom Weber, Tarnabu Weber. Uh, there might be some more, I don't know, but uh, yeah, I think that's. Uh, that's pretty good at a start because I remind you as it was the program axiomatize and classify. I think we did enough work here. And then comes the problem. Yeah, developed have have homogeneous spaces, all that, construct many of them, integrate over them, understand if they are Riemannian or not, and go to NCG. So uh, yeah, you must develop all this. And uh, many questions here. Um, so yeah, there are more and more. So that's something I started with uh, the Bashish Goswami long ago. And then when the um, Skalski Sultan, and then I did the work myself and it's like never ending. So uh, we have coset spaces, partial isometry, things like that. And also a notion of a fine homogeneous space somehow. But yeah, a lot of work. Importantly, you can integrate so all these things, especially between classical and free. If you look at, well, you don't have characters anymore, but uh, you have some variables there which are quite natural. They are related by Berkovich quota, so that's important. So now all these things, 
are they Riemannian or not? <laughs> so it's definitely not smooth. I mean, there's no smoothness in all these things. But uh, you can look for Laplace and things like that. So that's uh, Uwe Franz and the others are working on this. Like Anakula, Cipriani, Fabio, Anamskalski, Bisvaru Gas, uh, Sumi Wang. Yeah, many people are into this, uh, these questions. And they have. Uh, for the spheres, for instance, it's easy to construct some high spaces of the Laplacian, but the eigenvalues was a big problem. This was just solved by my friends and the others. They have a formula, and uh, the Oracle of Pony don't have it, but uh, well, if you have a Laplacian, <laughs> that's good enough. I think you have a Lap we have Laplacian and Weingarten formula, so uh, I think we're definitely Riemannian here, and in Malanash, we have coordinates. So the point is to unify with corn somehow, and uh, it's in both senses somehow. From corn, when doing corn, you would like to have a Nash theorem. So that's the first question that we have. What manifolds a la corn admit embeddings into free spheres or other type of non commutative spheres so that you can have coordinates, okay? In the other sense, there is all this work by Franz and the others. So, uh, I think in the long run, well, that is probably uh, that's nice geometry and that's one. I mean, they, they have a big overlap in all the existing objects are, are here, probably. So, uh, yeah, that would be the project to develop a Nash con geometry. Last but not least, if you look at the initials of this, this is MCG. Yeah, <laughs> miracle. <laughs> so, uh, once you have it, you can call it MCG and uh, everyone shuts up. But once again, yeah, there's a lot of work needed here, and uh, yeah, personally, I'm more into books on that, so welcome. Okay, now let's talk about the last topic. So, one matrix models, these are, uh, yeah, as for Torah, these are things which are extremely basic. So, let's remember that uh, GNS was telling us that we have operator algebras here, so let's try to model them. Of course, I don't want to be of age to be my model space because it's the generic thing we don't know that much about B of age. So I'll take a random matrix algebra. That's random matrices, okay? Matrices over uh, some space T is a classical space. The problem is that if you want your model to be faithful, uh, you won't get far. I mean, G must be aminable, I type one. Well, it's, it must be small, okay? So the solution to this is this trick we found with the Julien. So, uh, Define the Hopf image, you just factorize, you see if it factorizes or not, and you take the, the smallest thing, uh, smallest subgroup, H in G processing such a factorization. And if there is none, you call it in our faithful. This is not the same as faithfulness, it's, it's much, much weaker, but it still remembers the quantum group. So there are two things. It's much weaker than uh, faithfulness, to the point that there's no counterexample. It's conjecture to exchange all such models, so it can cover everything virtually. And on the other hand, it's strong enough as to remind the quantum group. So it's a very, very clever compromise there, okay? It's somehow you're still in the general case and you remind the quantum group, it's really cool. And uh, so I remind, yeah, from algebra, you get a Tanakian category, I mean, uh, the home spaces, just look at the model and take the formal thing there, home spaces, and that's your home spaces. That's a result of Julian. And also the higher integration, yeah, analysis, you want to do integration. It's just like the Voronovich formula for the hard measure, but uh, putting some of the Cesar limit. We're putting the random matrix trace here. Uh, of course, here for two years, and that uh, it is a probability space. One works for an arbitrary compact space. So this is a uh, yeah, long story here. It's Franz Kalski with me. And then uh, who was that? Simon Wong from the proof in general. So this is done. Just here, yeah, you have Tanak higher integration. What else do you need? Yeah, definitely reminds the quantum group. With this, you can do anything that you want. Now, uh, well, the thing is that there are many difficult questions here. So. Uh, yeah, good conjecture to prove. I think that's very tough functional analysis. <laughs> prove that any quantum group can be modeled like this, and even even for S M plus, it's open. I mean, uh, not really well. Uh, how is that? I, I don't remember. Like Brandon Frelon, these guys work on that. And, uh, 
I think that they still have some cases left. It's, it's true for our engineering, but also reflection groups. All this is dependent on this curiosity to business. Well, let's not get into this. It's extremely technical, but uh, yeah, that's one of the main problem to prove that it works. Okay, and that would be nice. Uh, any kind group has a faithful model. Now let's uh, go to the opposite. Now there are many interesting models actually which are faithful. So let's talk about faithfulness now. And I'll actually call them stationary because it's nicer. Uh, so we not only we say, yeah, let's go for faithful, but let's go for it fully. So we, we not only want the model to be faithful, but we want the integration to be just a uh, random matrix trace. And actually, if you have this, this implies faithfulness. It's a bit of functional analysis. So that's why finally, that's a good definition to look at these things. And we'll call them stationary, because you, if you look at this as our limits, you see you convolve here, well, it's, it's a stationary convergence there. So that's, uh, well, there is also a reason I know this is supposed to relate to statistical mechanics and uh, there are uh, some stationary there going on. So, uh, Okay, so it's a bit better than faithful, let's put it like this stationary. And now, as basic example, yeah, let's go back to these half liberations, which were very interesting. So uh, we can model n star in this way, and you n star in this way. So let's take a look at the first one. You see this matrix and the diagonal, they have commuted, I mean, ABC, CBA. So uh, that's why you have the model, and same is true is here. Well, the difference is that, uh, well, this is self-adjointed, this is not. That's why here you have to use only UN, but here, not being self-adjoint, you have the freedom of using uh, two different sets of coordinates, and that's why you can use two copies of UN, it's bigger in one space. So, yeah, the thing is that these are faithful. So, faithfulness is known from Bishon Duarte, and it's also stationary, also known from them, but you can prove it right away with this. So very nice, and uh, a lot of extensions of this. Actually, the whole we we're talking before about of classical geometry in this NCG sense. So Julian proved that everything can be modeled there by uh, by by such two by two matrices, the sphere and its subspaces, to be more precise. And there are also yeah, there are also versions of this instead of star, put more complicated things. I love one Weber, let's say, but well, yeah, let's not get into these very interesting things, uh, which are still ongoing. Now, another interesting model, I remember S4 plus is SO3 minus one. So uh, uh, actually you have this model, that's something I found this long ago with Benoit Collins, that was the beginning of this matrix model story. And uh, given just by uh, this tricky formula using the Pauli matrices, it's kind of cool. And uh, with Benoit, we proved it. We proved that it's stationary, so it's a terrible Weingarten computation taking 10, 15 pages, I think. And then Julien Bichon came with a simpler proof using the fact that S4 plus is SO3 minus one. So if you think uh, enough, it, it comes from there finally. But this is really nice and it has many extensions to uh, uh, so-called vial matrices. So it, uh, you should try, it, this is really cool. So if you want to try to generalize, you have to put something else here and here. And your Nikita came with this idea that the Pauli matrices are particular cases of vial matrices. So we get model for these guys here on the, on the left. Well, it's a bit more complicated to get some subgroups. So while matrix models, yeah, that's the thing. There are many open questions there. But we have with, uh, with Jon and the others, half liberation and versions, flat models, okay, well, and the uh, synchron things. Yeah, there are many people, all these guys are, I talked about, they, they work on that. So, like Germans, the guys, in, uh, a bit motivated by quantum information, like Nikita and Brannan, algebraized, it's Kirgozi to Freno. Also, it's very related to quantum embedding. I mean, uh, this implies the quantum embedding. So these guys like very new. The others are interested. So yeah, very interesting topic, matrix models. Now, let's talk in the end about uh, Adamar matrices. That's, that's really cool. So it's part of this, this modeling business. 
But we'll start to the story because all these all these modern things are quite recent. So when was that? My paper with Benoit, the first one with Pauli was 2006, I think. So it's uh, I have 10 years old, and uh, well, the story goes back to some uh, Pope and John things in the 80s for my other my matrices. It's a particular case of models. So uh, let's talk about that a bit. So it's, it comes from von Neumann algebras. So. Um, We we'll talk about, yeah, I think we talked a bit about von Neumann when we did the big metan. So, yeah, these are, uh, and then in the beginning, the first lecture, I told you I learned some von Neumann algebra. So, hope you learned in the meantime, <laughs> you know, what I'll be talking about. So, what's important are factors, also abelian sub algebra, that's always the method in dealing with von Neumann algebras, the masses, maximal abelian sub algebras. And uh, one well, Popeye started to look a bit, so the massa technology is all goes back to von Neumann, but Popeye started to look at orthogonal massa, somewhat how a coordinate of these masses uh, that would be very interesting. And he discovered, I think it was uh, 86, that well, up to a unitary, the orthogonal massa in the men of C, the simplest possible algebra, are so one massa is the diagonal matrix, right? It's a billion maximal. And the other one, you have to spin, right, delta by something. And the spinning matrix must be a Damar. A Damar meaning entry zone, namely circle, and rows pairwise orthogonal. So as a conclusion of all this, extremely important, this Adamar matrix is okay for fundamental algebras. Now you can build on this, and Jones did it in the 80s. So you take these two masses, you put them in a diagram like this. So they sit inside the of C. And the point is that the, the expectations from the big one, from MN to the delta and the delta spin commutes. And the product is the expectations, the trace. So this is the so-called commuting square in some factor theory. And now, uh, well, you can do this so-called basic construction of Jones here as a factor in the end there. Whose invariant can be computed by nano compactness. And Jones proved that uh, this factor must appear somehow as a fixed point algebra by some kind of one group. To be more precise, it's a spin planar algebra. So that's why it's a suggestion that there might be some point permutations there. And the answer to all this, all these are very interesting questions. Okay, to Popa uh, and Jones, for my algebra, to understand these factors associated to the Adamar matrices. And the answer is yes, you have one permutations. It's extremely simple, the construction. So let's take another one matrix, meaning uh, entries on any circle and uh, rows pairwise orthogonal. Then we get these projections, they, they form a magic unitary. Because well, yeah, that's, the rows are orthogonal if you divide them. You know, still, when I speak, J varies and so on, and vice versa, some is one, of course. So now you have a magic unit, or you have a representation like this, right? You map this uij to this magic here. And you can take the whole image factorization, the one we were talking about before. So that's the construction. To any other more matrix, finally, you can uh, associate a quantum permutation group. What are the results now? You want this correspondence. So first of all, if you take the Fourier matrix of an Iberian group, that's a Damar. It's actually the basic example of a Damar. And the construction gives you G. So this is very interesting because it shows that uh, this construction somehow you have, or you have a finite abelian group has a Fourier matrix, and this is vice versa. Somehow construct a quantum group whose Fourier matrix somehow is that Adamar matrix. It's very interesting. And, uh, you want that, so that's the basic thing, of course, it's very easy, but uh, it's just classical groups. Also, tensor products about tensor products, of course, because we have in our faithful, well, you can get formulas for Hartanaka duality, whatever, for a quantum group in terms of your matrix. This extends a bit what uh, Von Jones was doing, and everything is understood, quantum squares of factors. So, all that is understood now. At the level of examples, the one Fourier, you can can take the formations of the Fourier matrices. So these are very interesting the parameters. Generic or uh, more uh, 
more concrete sort of formal so there's been a lot of work here by uh by Burstein first a student of uh, one of Jones and then by by me and Julia we did it in the January case a bit better than Burstein because we also compared uh, the spectral measures there we get some Poisson rose compounds and uh, then you have this problem of uh, yeah these parameters yeah well it's a bit like Griffel Gibbs you know, the parameter is a root of unity you get weird stuff there and here it's a bit similar so uh, there are some papers by me and Julia on the subject. Also, some work with Adam Skalski on uh, partial animal matrices. So, very, very important all this. And uh, the, the motivation, I think, it's uh, well, there are all these questions about animal matrices, and uh, these quantum groups are supposed to help and always be conjectures and all that. And that can be a motivation. Then, massa, also the general theory of models. Uh, Especially this Fourier thing. I mean, it's uh, what's the Fourier matrix? No, vice versa. <laughs> it's vice versa. Uh, that's very fun because the Fourier matrix. How to say? Quantum permutation groups are compact. Okay, they are not even finite. So, if you're looking for some kind of Fourier matrix, it's huge. It's infinite. <laughs> but this is somehow finite. I mean. Uh, for this quantum groups is, is very weird. I mean, it's a kind of new type of, uh, of Fourier thing. So, yeah, keyword Fourier, I know. So, very interesting questions here. And questions, yeah, physics, how to apply all this to physics. Many people in quantum information, there should be some applications of these models to statistical mechanics following this work of Jones. It's not done yet. We talk about no commutative geometry. If you go there, physics is the standard model. So uh, there's been work by uh, Andrea Dabrowski. Uh, Andrea Dabrowski does and booming on the frequency group of the standard model, like this chump said in Con Sing. So uh, yeah, many, many interesting things to be done there too. And uh, is there everything? So some factors talk about it, the statistical mechanics, basically. And uh, about the joint, yeah, standard model things, free probability, of course, random matrices, all many things to be done. And uh, yeah, quantum information, all this quantum permutation business is very related. So it's hot. So physics. Okay, guys, that's uh, that's it. So this was an introduction to research. Okay, I, uh, yeah, that's how research goes, and uh, it's uh, it's hard, and uh, well, you can learn all these things. Of course, you have all these blogs, YouTube channels, whatever, web pages, books, articles. Go to Twitter, Facebook, and find guys. So uh, everything. We're trying to keep things on the internet in quantum groups. I think that's important for the future and. Are kind of computer geeks, many of us. So uh, yeah, it's gonna increase all that, and uh, I think that's a good thing. Okay, guys, take care. I'll see you soon.